I wrote a I read this book uh, last year and uh, it's getting some attention, but I go to a whole lot of scary meetings uh, with geoengineers and people that want to fix the sky and, and change the way the planetary systems work. And, and so I, I've been meeting people who are uh, pretty much Rube Goldberg-like with their gadgetry, and uh, also people that want to weaponize the sky. And so there are a lot of new Dr. Strange loves in this kind of business. Uh, so what I wanted to just go through relatively quickly, there's a lot more behind this if you're interested. We can chat later, or a lot of the stories are in the book. Uh, in fact, Jeff, there was a story in there about the twist in the Gulf Stream in 1904, where uh, somehow they dug the Panama Canal and the Panama Canal collapsed, changing the Gulf Stream, causing it to snow all over England, and with the glacier kind of story. And uh, the, the, the upshot was the Scots all moved to London, and the Londoners all moved out and moved to the colonies. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a sci-fi geoengineering thriller that I like to collect. I but uh, today, uh, let's see, I can do this myself, I think. Um, it's my first tragic comedy. The book is not, has no really heroic characters. A lot of history of science is about standing on the shoulders of giants and doing the things that have never been seen before. Well, most of these people, almost all of them, are either <coughs> pretty much charlatan-like or are uh, people who are uh, uh, a kind of a uh, uh, sincere but deluded pathological passion for what they're doing so that they have sort of tunnel vision on a very sweet technological idea that they're trying to promote. And then I found, uh, when I got my first copy, I thought, I, I think this is going to be really policy relevant because there are a lot of meetings now. There's, there's, there's one every month. There are two or three every month. And I usually go as the only historian in the group trying to provide a sense of past perspective on things that most of the people consider to be completely um, uh, new ideas, they're really not. There's a lot of history behind this. Uh, unprecedented challenges. Uh, we have some unprecedented challenges, but this, this one's been precedented before. And uh, my, I like to say that if you go around and say everything's unprecedented, it probably means you're not reading very much history because you, you find a lot of this stuff in there. Uh, and so with, with, uh, with that, when Paul Crutzen, the Nobel laureate, atmospheric chemistry uh, gave his modest proposal. Uh, he actually wrote an editorial in 2006 called uh, Geoengineering the Climate, a Modest Proposal, question mark. And I really focus on the question mark because I think he suggested using naval rifles in the tropics to shoot sulfates into the stratosphere to offset shortwave radiation so that the long wave global warming heating didn't cook us. And I thought, wow, that's really wild. And, and, and that started a whole bunch of uh, meetings. The first one I went to was at NASA Ames out west, Mountain View, and uh, heard on the Google campus. And they were talking about space mirrors, sulfates um, cannonading and shooting things up and making the clouds brighter, and a whole bunch of uh, technical things. You probably might have seen them in popular science as far as the coverage of that. Uh, but I thought, I, I took Critson, Critson's a very nice man, an elderly gentleman, Nobel laureate, but I took it a kind of a Jonathan Swift. I can solve the Irish family. I've got an idea. And so the idea is so outrageous that when, when we present it to the general public, when we say, what do you think about uh, naval cannons shooting sulfates, or what do you think about uh, opening fire on global warming, <laughs> you know, uh, they think, oh, or would you rather uh, do sincere mitigation? And, an energy tra uh, tra transformation. And they used to say, oh, oh, even if they weren't for it before, they'll sort of go for the idea of clean green energy rather than fighting global warming with military equipment. So Critson might be doing a, a service in a way, but the people at Mountain View, they thought that he was their champion. And they're, now they were able to go out and talk about all the gizmos and all the gadgets that they had access to. And a lot of these people were from national labs and like Lawrence Livermore, and some of them were cold warriors, and extremely prominent cold warriors who wanted to use this technology to fix the planet. And so I got back after all this was euphemistically called solar radiation management. And I came back scratching my head and saying, boy, that was kind of a, a weird meeting. And I did a little uh, cartooning of my own. This is what I took from the meeting. Uh, too many sunbeams will just go up and cut some off and we'll cool the planet off with, with these technologies. 
And so uh, that began the process that led me to write this book, Fixing the Sky. Uh, I, I also used them, uh, a little bit, I have the stories about the Gulf Stream, but I also have mythological stories to start out. Uh, showing that this idea about taking control of nature is very deep in the human psyche. And this is uh, Phaeton, one of the four disgracers of Greek mythology, who wanted to drive his dad's sun chariot through the sky. And uh, Helios said, oh my God, I don't think you could handle this, but I promised you you could have anything you asked. And he did ask to drive my chariot, so he said, hold on to the reins, so the, ch uh, the horses will be skittish, but stay on the middle path and drive it through the sky. And of course, uh, there's a disaster, the horses considered him to be a lightweight. Uh, they took off and went anywhere they wanted to. They were burning up the surface of the earth. And this is the scene of Zeus shooting Phaeton out of the sky. Now, that would just be a Greek myth, a, a kind of a neat one. There's definitely you know, Daedalus, and there's Ixion, and there's Prometheus. There's all these people. But a very prominent meteorologist up at MIT wrote a book called, or wrote an article in Boston Magazine called Phaeton's Reigns. That was the name of the article. It became a little MIT press book. And he argued that we need to learn so much about climate that we can take up Phaeton's reins and drive the Earth by managing its solar radiation or by titrating its oceans or whatever. So I showed it to my research assistant, a geographer, not really a meteorologist, and she says, oh my God, that's a completely strong misreading of Phaeton. You know, it's, it's taking that idea that, that you get into trouble when you do things that you shouldn't be doing and taking it to be, let's do it, kind of a kind of a Cole Porter approach to things, you know. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I use this story to frame the thing, and then I'm going to bring you a couple more framing devices. I call this the Rube Goldberg approach. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, during drought in Texas, there was a concerted effort to shoot off fireworks and cannon and, and make quite a ruckus down in the panhandle to make it rain. This was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But uh, this cartoon from the the Farm Implement News of Chicago uh, has a, 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 weather, a weatherman, or a courier from the telegraph office bringing a U.S. Weather Bureau forecast. And the forecast is for rain. And so our protagonist on the left, General Dyronfort, is saying, hurry up and shoot the cannon, launch the balloons, fly the kites, set off the fireworks, and we'll take credit for the rain when it comes. Because uh, they had no rain gauges and no meteorologists. They just put on a hell of a fireworks show down in dry land, Texas. But it was dry Texas in July and early August. So I was writing my book a couple years ago, July and early August, and I, I said, I, I think I'll throw up the, this Weather Channel image, and it was all kinds of thunderstorms all over Texas, because it's the annual monsoon where the, the, the rain comes up from the Gulf of Mexico, and you, more days than not in this period you have rain. So they would shoot off their fireworks, entertain the locals, have great parties at night, and anywhere it rained, anywhere near them, they would take credit for it. And so that's why I call it kind of a Rube Goldberg approach to, uh, to weather control. Now, in humor, there's usually a, you know, there's a storyteller, there's the object of the joke, and then the audience is supposed to get it, you know. And, and the object here is to tell stories about Dyronforth in my book, but I'm really proxying these Rube Goldberg moderns who are out there convening meetings at NASA, et cetera, and trying to use this military hardware and fireworks, the naval cannon, to fix the sky. So it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's humor by deflection to a new, a new object. Uh, there's also the hail cannon, uh, the paragrails of Austria, and again, the metaphor of shooting, the motif of firing in the sky. But if your grapes are gonna go and your wine harvest, your wine industry is in, pro in trouble, are you gonna do nothing or are you gonna open fire? So the, the Austrians decided to open fire. And it's kind of like, a, uh, if we don't do, if we, if we don't uh, do the Kyoto stuff, if we don't do the mitigation, if we don't do the adaptation, if we don't do the green energy, then we, I think we're going to open fire in the sky, and especially the people with the military uh, means to do that. Uh, just another Rube Goldberg idea. This is an actual U.S. patent uh, by uh, Lars Leroy Brown in Kansas, right about the time of this uh, Texas thing. He proposed building a very high tower with a, 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 basically a circuit. There's a big battery at the bottom of the tower. The wire runs up the tower. The wire, it's, it's kind of truncated, but the wire goes all the way down to this side. And what he does is during a large thunderstorm or maybe a pending tornado, Brown climbs the ladder in a 
Kansas field and slides a charge of dynamite down the wire. And when the dynamite hits the bottom, it connects the circuit back to the battery and detonates, chasing away the, th <laughs> chasing away the thunderstorm. Now, uh, first of all, you're going to climb a high tower in a Kansas field in the middle of a thunderstorm. And then you're going to slide dynamite down the end of it, blowing off the end of the tower the first time it actually detonates. But he has a US patent. I don't think it was ever built or ever practiced. But it's, it's an example, only one example, of many, many of the kind of Rube Goldberg devices that are coming into this uh, field of weather control really quite early, really 19th century stuff. Even in the 20th century, this is about 1920, the US military got involved in generating electrified sand, very high voltage sand that they could dump out of airplanes onto fogs and clouds. And the neat thing about this was the sand was intended either to dissipate the cloud or to make it rain. So they had it both ways. If you dissipated the cloud, you called it a success. And if you made it rain, you called it a success. And on a given day, clouds are either like building or dissipating. So, so that the uh, US Army Air Corps and some, uh, some really interesting patent holders uh, uh, tried to generate this stuff where they blew electric sand into the clouds, mainly because um, of aviation needs. The fog was the big and, and dangerous flight. It turns out that weather control, and the theme of this is, weather control always hitches a ride on the latest technologies. So back in the day, in the 19th century, it was the technologies of, uh, of, of the cannonading of the clouds. In the, in the early 20th century, it was the airplane that was driving this. And I'll show you a couple more where later on the hydrogen bomb <laughs> ends up becoming a player. Um, this is another image from uh, my God, is it, is it from Popular Science Monthly? I didn't plan this. It was not a set, I, I was just putting my slides together. But Popular Science Monthly has this image of a plane with electrical wires sparking. And the idea here was that you could clear out uh, smokes in, in uh, factories with electric sparks. And so they're trying to clear the air of the city. And then coming behind it is this other plane that's uh, dropping the sand and clearing out all the storms and manufacturing uh, a very fresh and clear air. So it wasn't, and also it wasn't just to make rain, but there's the old theory that the stagnant air was bad and it was bad for your health. So this was sold as a public health good as well, as a safety and transportation good. So the agriculturalists like to do it because if their crops are building, they pay these people to try stuff. And the shipping people loved it, and the urban dwellers, and also then the, the, the whole public health movement would get in, involved in this. So there was some money, you know, large, large proposals and large amounts of money transacting here. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping, you know, because of the short time period, but in the book on page 248, you'll see this cartoon of the 1992 proposal by the National Academy of Sciences to shoot dust into the stratosphere with naval rifles. And I met this guy, Bob Frosch, he was the head of the U.S. Navy, it was like an associate admiral or whatever they called him. And he was in charge of the naval cannon. And I saw him about two years ago. I said, Dr. Frosch, what do you think about this naval cannon idea now? He says, oh, we've got the barrels. We're just ready. We just need to put some liners in. We're ready to go. He was all excited about it. <laughs> so I worked with a, another environmental historian. And we decided that what they overlooked in this proposal, and they said it was cheaper than mitigation, cheaper than decarbonization, just shoot the stuff up shoot whatever you want to, they have vacuum cleaner dust in the cartoon, but shoot whatever you want up there, and it'll be cheaper than the very high cost of decarbonizing the whole economy. This is 1992, and Nor William Nordhaus of Yale was the economist pretty much behind this. Uh, we, a friend of mine and I calculated that they forgot that lower atmospheric pollution, that blowing all these cannons off, like one every five minutes, would uh, put all that uh, uh, gunpowder smoke into the lower atmosphere. Plus, after a thousand shots, the barrels melt. And then you have to, <laughs> you have to re melt them, put them back in the steel mill, melt them down, and reform them. So the amount of energy needed to do that is just completely ridiculous. There was no, nowhere in this calculation from the US National Academy of Sciences. But this is the, this is the 1992 moment. Again, you notice the theme of cannonading. If something's wrong, you shoot at it. So he's shooting at the sky to save the world. <laughs> There's more, wait. <laughs> and uh, 
And, uh, and that is the basis of Kritzen's editorial in 2006 that again opened this new uh, recent cycle of discussion about geoengineering. But for a historian like me, it's just like, okay, so what else is new? Then that, the, all these people are gathering to talk about new ways to use military hardware. Uh, this is just a joke slide, but uh, I really do find a lot of people worried about methane as well as carbon dioxide. <laughs> and so this is a methane collect here on the cow. Uh, I was at the Convention of Biological Diversity this summer in London, and I was the guy that was trying to put history into the, the geoengineering side of biodiversity. And there was a fellow there who says, oh my god, we've got to teach these cows how to climb under tents to collect their methane while they're chewing the cut. So he wants to start an education program for cows. <laughs> <laughs> and he also, he was really excited. He's an emeritus professor of engineering who was proposing the, uh, the cloud brightening ships that would fly the oceans and make the clouds brighter. And he says, look, if I park one of my cloud ships off San Diego, I can make it rain in Australia. I said, in your model. He says, it, not in my model, but in this other guy's model. <laughs> and so <laughs> they're playing like video games. It's like Simmer. And I said, and, and his assumption was that everybody was a beneficent environmentalist. Everybody wanted the health of the planet to go first. I said, well, what if the people in San Diego were mad at the people in Australia and they parked the cloud ship out there and they had this teleconnection that you could invent? So it's a very dicey thing. And I said that the 20th century is not a century of great cooperation. It's a century of World War I and World War II and you know, antagonisms. And so how can you assume that it's going to be only for good if you develop this giant leverage of the planet. Uh, so the, the bottom line is that the military has been extremely interested in geoengineering, weather control, geoengineering, and all-weather air force, fighting with the clouds. And so that's another thing beside the commercial interest. This is his cloud-making machine, uh, Stephen Salter at Edinburgh. And the principle is these things blow in the wind, and they just get blown around the oceans in different directions. But the wind also turns these rotors and they pump up salt water. And the salt water forms little condensation spots for the, for the liquid and it makes the clouds cloudier. He has no understanding of hydrology, no training in hydrology. And so you end up possibly changing not only the brightness of the planet, but uh, in certain spots, but the hydrologic cycle. You might stop it from raining. Now, about 90% of our rain falls over the oceans for the whole planet, and uh, about 10% on the continents. Uh, this is a high altitude aerial vehicle coming off the drawing boards from the Defense Department. It flies in the, uh, near, it flies in the stratosphere, giant hydrogen balloon. And it has a variance on any given day of about 50 kilometers, because there's big winds up there. You don't know exactly where it's going to be on a given day. Well, one of the guys I'll tell you about in a minute wanted to attach a 50 kilometer hose to this as a spray pump for the sulfates. To, out from this balloon. I said, okay, 50 kilometers up, 50 kilometer hose, and it's moving 50 kilometers this way and that way. It's going to rip off and whip around like a giant phallic hose falling down from the stratosphere at some point. Uh, but this is a military idea to, and they, they were going to test it in London with a one kilometer hose and a, one, and a smaller balloon over East Anglia, somewhere near uh, Norwich. And the general, uh, it was either the combination of the environmental interest groups or the general public and pressure on them to, to stop the experiment. So they're not going to pump uh, stuff and crap. They were going to pump water. Now, <laughs> there's so much to tell you, but I just want to give you a flavor of this field because pumping a one kilometer pipe of water over Norwich is different than pumping a 50 kilometer pipe of sulfates over the planet. But they, they consider it to be a field test. And what we really need today, they're arguing, is a field test. I argue, okay, go ahead and do your models, build a computer model of the Earth, put some stuff in it, but keep it behind closed doors. Like maybe do it here at Studio X. <laughs> but don't take it on the street and put a, put a balloon over Manhattan and shoot crap up there. Because you'll, you'll drive the general public crazy. And it's also not an environmentally sound thing to, to do. Uh, this is the New York Times about the same time. Uh, two overheated, Henning Wagenbrecht, the German cartoonist, two overheated polar bears on a, sinking, on a shrinking ice flow, desperately trying to keep this hose up and pump their sulfur into the stratosphere. And in the background, there's naval guns. This is the naval guns. So this cartoonist caught it perfectly. We don't know if they're Russian guns that wanted to keep the Arctic open for geopolitical purposes, or they're US guns trying to stop something. 
or they're shooting sulfates from the guns. It, it's just a very complex little cartoon that tells, uh, it tells a lot of the stories I like to tell. And it's also kind of a, a gendered thing because they're, it's a polar bear couple we're trying to keep it up. Uh, and then I, I, well, I was, one, of, one of the meetings was at MIT, and this was the icon for the meeting. Engineering a cooler earth, can we do it? Should we try? The morning was, can we do it? And it was just goofy. This is where the, the Rip Goldberg stuff came in. I was with a friend last night who was uh, at the meeting. And should we try was in the afternoon. It was a few of us, historians and policy people and sociologists, saying, That's, you know, there's really some problematic things here that you're, you're not... Uh, the idea here is that people are trained in technical fields like climate modeling, but they're not trained in any social dynamics. And so they're just saying, I got an idea, and let's do this. So I've got an envelope, and I did on the back of the envelope the calculation, and we can, and, and that has nothing to do with the social import. So here's a giant male hand uh, turning a thermostat that's nowhere, or perhaps it's up in the atmosphere or beyond the atmosphere. And I just had a lot of fun. I brought it. Uh, to the meeting. This is an actual slide from that meeting where I said uh, it's a godlike God scale male hand on the thermostat. It was the organizer shot his own hand when he was getting the poster ready. Uh, the thermostat is nowhere. It's not in any particular place. Imagine a global thermostat. Uh, you, you have roommates or anything? Or you ever fight about saving money versus being comfortable? And, and so if there's 190 nations and the, the thermostat would not, probably not be built in Indonesia, you'd have a big fight over the global temperature. Um, the temperature on this image is 73 Fahrenheit being turned back to 54, which is five degrees colder than the Earth is right now. <laughs> so it, it was just a setup. It was just for fun, you know. And um, the other one was... Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, look, I have the high resolution version. <laughs> And it's, sub it's Mexico, Texas area there, and it's centered on Roswell. So that, that's how I felt about it. Okay. Uh, oh, so you're fixing the sky, but is it really that broken that you need to fix it? So um, I came out of some of these meetings very clearly thinking that back of the envelope wasn't good enough, that the proposals needed to have fresh air. There was a danger that DARPA would do this, the Defense Department Advanced Research Projects Agency or the Department of Energy would do it without very much review, or just the Americans would do it, or maybe the Americans in the UK would do it without any other nations, without any other input from intergenerational, interdisciplinary, or international sources. And so I argued, and I put some of this in policy documents, that we need a historical cultural effort to talk about this, as well as those Rube Goldbergs that want to do it. So that's kind of the Rube Goldberg side. But then there's the Dr. Strangelove side which is the militarization of weather control. And again, it goes back to the history of meteorology and for the Crimean War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Cold War, it very much parallels the history of militarism. And uh, just for an example, World War I, well, what the hell, they had 10 kilometers downwind going, with the shells going up into this high atmosphere and coming down. They had to have meteorologists to figure out where the shells were going. Uh, the poison gas. They had weekly, for they had daily forecasts until EAP, and then after the poison gas flowed, they had hourly forecasts, trying to figure out if they could launch or survive a poison gas attack. And I think some of this low boundary layer, low level meteorology called micro meteorology comes out of over one poison gas. So you can tell the history of science through the history of military quite a bit. And then uh, one of the Dr. Strange left an actual model for. Um, for Dr. Strangelove was uh, Irving Langmuir, Nobel Prize winner at, at, uh, at General Electric. And again, I mean, I started with a Nobel laureate, Paul Critson, who kind of invades our space and tells us to shoot at the stratosphere. And here's a Nobel laureate who was really developed at the new light bulb when he was a surface chemist at GE. But he goes into the atmosphere and he decides he can control the weather with his little chemical formulas of silver iodide and solid carbon dioxide. The further connection is that Langer worked with Bernie Vonnegut. Bernie was Kurt's uh, brother. And Kurt Vonnegut was a publicist at GE, writing these sci-fi novels on the side while he was thinking about, uh, you know, helium rather than Schenectady and uh, the General Electric Corporation as uh, Well, Kurt has a, he has an epigraph. He calls it, uh, General Electric is science fiction. 
And that's the way he treated his job there. He hated it, but he wrote about it. And so Langmuir had this notion to use silver iodide, and the military picked up on it, to drop uh, seeding uh, materials. Here's our, our, this is in Collier's Magazine from 1954. The seeding plants would, and not just in Collier's, but this was from Eisenhower's weather advisor, Howard Orville, the official report of the government study of weather modification came out in Collier's as a popularization. And these planes are delivering their nefarious load of little balloons and going back home. So what does the Air Force want? So they want to save their pilots. They want their Air Force planes on the ground and not getting shot down. So the little balloons with timers on them explode and drop into these little friendly little clouds over here, going from west to east, left to right. The agent, it says seeding agent, but in the article it says the seeding agents could be biological, radiological, or chemical loading of the clouds. The timers would then pop another agent in and would cause the precipitation at precise timing over the enemy. So you've got to stock them with radioactive rain. The second panel is the clouds getting angry and growing and getting big and turning into a big thunderstorm over here. And if, uh, I don't know if I have the, the blow up of that last panel on the right. I think I do. Yeah, it's a lightning bolt hitting the lead tank of a column coming in. <laughs> And just to illustrate how precise this could be, there's a lot of the images of precision and anger and militarization in the popular uh, graphic literature at the time. So uh, this was a scenario designed for Eastern Europe, Germany, Eastern Europe. It's because the weather's typically going from west to east. And so we would have a one-way, almost unidirectional weapon to bring the clouds against the, the, uh, the, the uh, Soviet bloc. This is Dr. Strangelove number two, Nicholas Christophilus, not an everyday word, but he's kind of like a junior Dr. Strangelove. He is uh, out at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, and above his head it says Argus. Argus was the three A-bombs we blew up in outer space in 1959, 58, sorry. And the theory, this is right, this is right before Sputnik, this is right before James Van Allen discovered these magnetic belts. And I use this story as actual geoengineering. People say, we've never tried geoengineering. I say, yes, we have. We tried to weaponize the magnetic belts as soon as we discovered them. And I just finished the paper showing that it's the, first, the closest combination of discovery and disruption that I've ever seen in the literature. He's talking about the Earth's magnetic field on the board. And I can almost imagine what he's saying. The Earth's magnetic field goes in these loops on the outside of the planet. If we set off a bomb in the Indian Ocean, the, lot, the, the charged particles and stuff will move along the lines of force and re-enter the atmosphere somewhere else. That somewhere else was Moscow. So if there was a crisis, and it was 58, 57 when I gave this lecture, if there was a crisis, we could simply go out and test the bomb in the Indian Ocean at the right point. And it would be one of these teleconnections to the magnetic field. And you predict, why do we want to have a solar weather force? We have a solar weather department now in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Why do you want to predict solar weather so you can know where the anti-point is? And we had, Washington, D.C. had one, too. It was out in the Pacific. And so they were worried about this global warfare. Also, setting off bombs in the outer space was an extension of our, of our older policy to set off bombs above our cities to interrupt uh, Russian bombers. Now we want to interrupt Russian incoming missiles. And the theory was it's better to bomb yourself at very high altitude than to have their bombs hit you on the surface. And this, so this is a strategic counter uh, doctrine of the, of the military, to weaponize outer space. The other thing you can do with a really big bomb is you can wipe out the whole ionosphere for you know, hours, even a half a day. And so there's no communications possible so what are they doing? They're developing their own little, uh, little tiny copper needles that they would shoot up on a different rocket to make their artificial ionosphere for military communications at the time. So they're really working as this is a battle space. This whole tendency, there was a little interruption, but James Van Allen then goes up, he discovers the magnetosphere, it's named now the Van Allen Belts, and he's kind of a squeaky king clean Iowan who gets all the praise as being a great discoverer of an eponymous phenomenon the Van Allen belts. He decided the same day that was announced, uh, 
May 1st, 1958, he decided to join the Argus project and build Explorer 4, America's third or third or fourth satellite, to fly into these belts and, and make the counts and measurements for the military. He did it with peaceful international geophysical uh, year money. And so, what was the? Uh, I like to. I mean, so what was the first instrument flown in space? What was the first scientific instrument flown in space? It was a Geiger counter. A Geiger counter. And one of Van Allen's buddies at Iowa wrote this on the board. He says, space is radioactive. 1958, after the, after the third uh, Explorer 3. Space is not a great vacuum. Space is not a wasteland. Space is not empty. Space is radioactive, according to this metaphor. And if it's radioactive, the military is quite interested in it because they wanted to make it even more radioactive during times of crisis for the advantage of their, of their um, troops. And this is the uh, 1962 Starfish Prime picture. It was shot over Johnston Island in the Pacific about, about 500 miles away. This is Hawaii. It was considered to be the, the greatest light show ever. Uh, it was not, we, we did a thing on NPR uh, last summer, the 4th of July. It was called the world's greatest light show, and it was this hydrogen bomb in outer space, 400 kilometers up. Uh, it blacked out Johnston Island for half a day because there was no radio communication after this happened. And the first message from the Pentagon to Johnston Island was, "Are you still there?" They thought they had killed themselves, and, and it wiped out the whole Pacific for, uh, and, and it was basically weaponization of, of space. And uh, my point, geoengineering. It's a planetary scale feature that they were screwing with and trying to manipulate and, and control, in a way, in, in their own, for their own purposes. So Dr. Strangelove, the real one here, I mean, Langer is one of the candidates, but Edward Teller, the father of the H-bomb, is Dr. Strangelove as well. And his protege, Lowell Wood, was sitting next to me at this NASA meeting, talking about shooting stuff up, pumping up, spew it out. Yes, that's three or four minutes. A couple of minutes, yeah. I can do it. Uh, this is uh, in Rolling Stone, the day of the meeting, 2006. Will Wood portrayed as Dr. Evil, invoking the giant volcanoes. Uh, the, the metaphor was make an artificial volcano because Pinatuba had cooled the earth. It's the Philippine volcano. So we'll make. Sorry. Cool. I think that's a sign to. Uh, uh, so we'll make, a, we'll make an artificial volcano. And, and the people at the meeting were saying, well, you want one Pinatuba or two, like one lump or two. Uh, you want to cool it a degree or two degrees, or we'll, we'll just set off these uh, mainly sulfate cannons. Uh, and so uh, my idea here is that from the surface, from 1945 on, we've had bombs on the surface as geoengineering devices, bombs in the space that I just told you about, and everything in between. Langmuir was involved in this seeding of the whole Pacific Ocean basin. Uh, other people were talking about using the space age to take up sulfates and nanoparticles into the stratosphere. And then there's, uh, uh, I don't know if I'll get time to talk to you about CO2 capture and sequestration. So, some framing devices. Uh, I said this is policy relevant, and fortunately, uh, we, we've been able to deliver this message to the Congress, to the General Accountability Office, to the National Academies, and to the Convention on Biological Diversity. As well as, two weeks ago, at the DARPA NASA 100-year starship meeting in Orlando, where everybody was all over the warp drive idea, but I was looking at it more from a biospheric point of view. So uh, I went to the WTF meeting in Orlando, and uh, uh, my talk was about terraformation, or what I call biosphere zero. We take Mars and make it into a habitable place. You know, a lot of sci-fi. Kim Stanley Robinson was at one of these meetings, and we were talking about his work. Um, Ice hinge as well as red, green, and blue. Uh, and then uh, I talked also about Biosphere 2, which was out in the Arizona desert. And here's a greenhouse attempting to be a biosphere. But the first mission failed for biogeochemical reasons. They had too much CO2 in the, in the system. And so they opened the doors after six months. And they came out into Biosphere 1, our Earth, and get a fresh breath of air and say, let's start again. And they did another experiment in the 90s. They closed the doors again after scrubbing it out. That one failed for human reasons because the uh, place, basically the management went bankrupt and the bionauts that didn't get to go on that mission broke the airlock and, and sort of monkey wrenched the experiment. 
So the biosphere failed for two reasons. One was technical and one was human. And now we don't know how to take a biosphere kind of thing into outer space. And they were talking about making a starship. And I, I kind of said, well, we already got kind of a neat starship. It's right here. It's the Earth in orbit. And we better learn how to take care of that. Some would say in the long future, we have to go out there or get away from the sun or whatever, you know, the sci-fi stuff. But the main purpose, uh, main thing for me was that uh, bringing this notion of terraformation to the table when you can't even make a greenhouse work as a closed system. We need to do a lot more of that. We need to do a lot more thinking about that before we try to make biosphere two prime, which would be the earth under these geoengineering regimes. This is a, just a busy picture with the space mirrors and the hail and the sulfur cannons and the iron fertilization of the oceans and the, and the pumping of methane and things. Before we do that, I think we should uh, be a little more uh, supportive of our own planet. So I'm going to uh, end, end here with my new work. And you always have to have something new. You should put your ongoing work on. And I'm working on uh, the ancient history of the substance before it was called CO2 that was known as Spiritus Lethalis. And Spiritus Lethalis was the vapor of death. The people coming to the Oracle at Delphi had to sit in a crack and they purify their bodies, purify their minds, fasting. Then they sit in a volcanic crack until they're ready to see the Oracle. And by that time, the cave gases had really got them. They were hearing things, seeing things, and then they got to see the Oracle. And many of them died before they got there. It was Spiritus Lethalis. And so we have a seminar this fall. Uh, uh, up at Colby, on, it's called Research on Carbon Dioxide, but it's really not carbon dioxide yet because they haven't identified it in the antiquity. And today, uh, you might call it toxic pneuma for the climate system, but in both cases it's either lethal or toxic, and it's this invisible substance that we're studying every aspect of. Before 1936, there was no talk about it as being a climate gas. It was always a refrigerant. CO2, carbonation, effervescence. Before that, it was the lethal gas. After 1936, they started to identify it with a radiatively active global warming kind of gas. And so everything now is global warming. And there's a very interesting saddle point there in 1936. And I'm, I know a lot about the post-36 stuff, having written a book on climate change. But I haven't fully explored all the antiquity of it. And we're, and we're doing carbonation next Tuesday night over in the Kobe pub, you know. That's what we're doing. Uh, and so finally, uh, there's, there's plans to uh, capture CO2. This is a Klaus Lackner tower from Columbia University, artist rendition of it. Huge buildings to pull in CO2. There's different designs of this. But if you put it underground and it doesn't stay there, you get kind of a late NIOS effect if it ever burps back up. So we're putting together the possibility that even something that sounds as great as sucking out CO2 and storing it, you'd have to store it forever, pretty much. It becomes very much like a nuclear uh, waste storage issue where you have to put it underground and keep it there in perpetuity. So if you're going to tip the planet, the old Archimedean tip, where you're standing somewhere and you've got never long enough, I like to ask, where would it roll if you tipped it? So that's, why, that's some of my work, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond or to talk later. I, I don't know if I got you behind schedule, but thanks for your attention. Um, yeah, unfortunately, because of time, we're going to have to be um, rel relatively quick. We can start setting up Mark uh, up here for, while, while Joe and I are wrapping up. Um, but I guess I'll just, just time for one, one question. I think it's, it's interesting, and many people have pointed out that you know, terraforming, large-scale uh, atmospheric re-engineering programs are uh, kind of, uh, uh, we have no idea what would happen, but the, 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 a lot of people point out that the, we're actually in the midst of the most complicated experiment already, which is that, you know, the tailpipes of cars, the massive industrial um, uh, facilities that we've already constructed, et cetera, and that, you know, what we call civilization now is coextensive with an unbelievably huge planetary engineering proposal. So I guess I'm just curious how, um, you know, you feel about the notion that we are in fact living inside an uncontrolled atmospheric experiment already and, and how that reflects on, on, on your research. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, very true. I, 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 I get scared when you, well, the, remember the cover of the book, the first one, when somebody has the lever, if Lowell Wood had the lever and there was one push-button experiment to change the temperature, I'd be really worried about it. 
But you're right, we have billions of tailpipes, millions of them. And I think we're going to have somewhat of an engineered managed planet in the future, but it's going to be through carburation or smart cars or change of fossil. The engineers will be involved in it, and architects too. But the idea that it's being, uh, the, most of the proposals I've been responding to were single bright ideas done on the back of an envelope. Sometimes with patents, with IP and invested in it, and trying to get a big fix, the big fix. I know how to fix the planet. So I, I think incrementally, probably, just like robotics, it wasn't Robbie the robot came to our house. It was a bunch of little subroutines here and there, and an artificial, and, and can't can manufacture and stuff like that. So I think the climate will be uh, more and more under uh, the, the center of the topic, but it won't be that one lever. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Well, in fact, it even seems that maybe multiple competing sub-experiments are is sort of going to be the, the way of the future, that it's not necessarily the, there's the U.S. climate initiative that's going to be that, which is going to be counteracting the effects of some sort of Chinese climate initiative. <laughs> so. well, the, it often comes up that we don't have anything in space or any ability to measure um, one degree temperature changes on the planet. So if somebody started geoengineering, we wouldn't even know if it was effective because it'd be in the realm of uh, annual noise. And so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people argue for better, if, if you had $10 billion, I'd say put it in basic understanding of the system or things like better satellite coverage of the, of the planet because the planet is our biosphere one. and. and and NASA is going to have missions out to other planets or to discover new things, but the home planet is a place to, to try to figure out how do you make this measuring and understanding move. So I, I had to write a thing for the Congress. I said, give them $10 billion. I just want $10 million myself. Um, <laughs> social historical stuff. Didn't get it. Very well. All right. Well, cool. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. For and, um, yeah, definitely pick up a copy of Fixing the Sky.